All right, thank you. Uh, why violent extremism, <clears throat> you know, still thrives. One of the nagging questions about the persistent wave of insurgencies in Africa is that they continue to be dominated by violent extremist <clears throat> groups. In fact, the number of insurgent groups that embrace extremist ideology, especially Salafi jihadism in this case, is on the rise. Right? So the mushrooming of violent extremist groups is puzzling. Why is it puzzling? It's puzzling because their objectives are far more radical than the people they claim to represent. Surveys and available data, I mean, they show that the vast majority of African Muslims, you know, they oppose violent extremism and terrorism. So, if African Muslims disagree with the methods, they disagree with the goals of violent extremist groups, then what explains the proliferation of these groups? Why is it that some African Muslims who do not espouse radical ideologies that the extremists embrace still sympathize and sometimes support these groups? Ladies and gentlemen, this is our puzzle. Some scholars and policy analysts, they attribute this prominence of violent extremist groups, as we have heard, you know, to religion or to ideology. Others, they argue that religion and ideology play little role and point instead to the strategic incentives for embracing violent extremist ideologies. In other words, citizens do not have to be diehard ideologues. They do not have to be violent religious extremists to lead or to buy into transnational and local groups defined by a radical ideological platform. They just need to think that their choice would yield dividends in contexts of state fragility and societal upheaval, as is the case in some African countries today. So this debate has significant implications for African countries trying to counter violent extremism. I mean, if you believe that it's all about religion and ideology, then obviously your response would differ than if you believe that citizens have rational reasons to favor ideologically extreme groups. My argument is that people's choice to join violent extremist groups is not primarily driven by ideology or religion. In fact, in several conflict-affected areas today, the adoption of extremist ideology as a tool of war continues to be a rationalist choice to violently contest the status quo. Again, as the case of several African countries demonstrates, in environments that are pervaded by state fragility, by bad governance, by intense inter- and intra-group tensions, individuals and communities, they tend to embrace any group that can offer them assurances of survival and, when possible, profit as well. In other words, People join groups and alliances based on relative power considerations. This does not mean that shared identity does not factor in individuals' considerations to join these groups. I mean, the fact that it does is one reason why extremist ideology usually intersects with the ethnic, the sectarian, Social and the social status configuration of society. Let's look at some examples. Let's take Ansar Dean and Mujal, the movement for oneness and jihad in West Africa. I mean, both of these groups, they emphasize radical Islam as the founding or the main founding block of their groups. But when it suits their purposes, they don't hesitate to appeal to race. They don't hesitate to appeal to ethnicity to recruit. In the case of Mujau, the group initially tried to distinguish itself from other 
armed groups whose sociological makeup is Arab by styling itself first as the defender of black African identity. That's how the group started. When the group ended up being a constellation of mostly Arab tribes, it quickly repositioned itself as a capable protector against what it calls untrustworthy ethnic others, such as the Tuareg. So the key here is the emphasis on protection and capability, as Mujao and other violent extremist groups in the Sahel and beyond. They know full well that alliances are not primarily driven by a shared repertoire of religious <coughs> beliefs and community identifications. An appreciable number of the rank and file members of violent extremist groups, they base the choice, their choice of alliances first and foremost on tactical necessities, driven by one, security considerations, and two, opportunism. And the cases from the Sahel, right, and beyond, they lend credence to this thesis, which argues that there is a strategic logic behind the alignment and ideological choices that insurgent leaders and their followers make. So this strategic situation gives violent extremist groups an advantage. And that's why they are the ones that are most prominent in the Sahel. How? In context of competing warring groups, in context of ethnic and religious fractionalization, rebel leaders, they struggle to persuade individuals to join uh, the fight to advance their cause. So what do they do? Well, there are different things you can do. First, insurgent groups, they try to mitigate this collective action dilemma by providing selective material benefits. They provide money, they provide social services, they provide protection, you know, in return for becoming a supporter, right, or fighter. Well, extremist groups have the added advantage of using ideology wrapped up or wrapped in religious ideas to motivate, to coordinate, and to retain recruits. As Barbara Walter showed, in the context of the Middle East, violent extremism helps draw the most devoted recruits on the cheap. An extreme ideology, she says, allows a group to recruit zealots who are willing to fight longer and who are willing to fight harder than the moderates. So the first movers, those that join the group, are usually high-quality rebels who create the impression that their armed struggle has a good shot at bringing about radical political change. So these fighters, you know, help the group win early battles and build a reputation for discipline and effectiveness. The result, as Barbara Walter says, is a type of tipping game. So how does it work? True believers, they join first because of their unwavering dedication to the cause. Then, more practical individuals join after because they believe the group is likely to win. This is exactly what happened in Mali in 2012. The successes of AQIM and its affiliated allies convinced many former fighters of the secular Tuareg group, MNLA, to defect to defect where? To defect to, you know, AQIM and Mujal because these groups were better funded and they were more organized than the MNLA. So, and by the way, the same thing happened in Syria, where the early successes of ISIS in Syria lured many foreign fighters from the Free Syrian Army to join ISIS. Why? Well, because ISIS had more money and it had better organization than the Free Syrian Army. So, regardless of how extreme the ideology might be, the future prospect of radical political transformation, buttressed by the promise of immediate access to guns, to protection, to money, ends up luring more moderate individuals into the orbit of violent extremist groups. And several case studies have demonstrated, or they have documented, 
how in contexts of socio-political instability, the temptation for aggrieved individuals and communities to join groups that can defend them is high. Surveys of young Fulani people in the conflict-affected areas of Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, they have revealed that majorities of Fulanis, they associate the state and its security and defense services as a threat to the security of their communities. And they assert the necessity to arm themselves as protection from perceived state abuse and stigmatization. So for an appreciable number of young men, violent groups appear as logical allies in environments teeming with plenty of armed groups. We see tons of armed groups, some of whom are believed to be supported by the same abusive security services. So again, in line with the main argument advanced in this presentation, the decision to join a, a, a ideological group is primarily driven by relative power considerations. In the case of young Fulanis, violent extremist groups today, they offer the promise that their armed struggle might not only proffer, uh, offer protection, but it might also yield an alternative socio-political model that is inspired by the principles and ideals of their own interpretation of Islamic law. So in the more immediate term, violent extremist groups are appealing because they tend to possess enough fighting power to help the Fulanis defend themselves, as well as compete in the struggle over access to natural resources with rival actions. And stories abound about how violent extremist groups appeal stem from their ability to provide security, from their ability to dispense harsh rule of law. Several recent studies and reports, they warn that, for example, in the Sahel, and checked state abuse is directly driving young men into the orbit of violent extremist organizations. So violent extremist groups are successful precisely because they pose as the only credible alternative to an unsalvageable status quo. <clears throat> so we need to reframe the problem. The main argument is that you know, the, the importance of radical ideology in the Sahel stems, you know, from its instrumental value. For rebel leaders, radical ideology, it helps their groups recruit. And it helps them stand out from the rest of the pack. Armed jihadi groups in the Sahel, they have learned that ideological purity and religious zeal can act as a useful branding strategy to differentiate themselves from rival groups. Let's take the case of Ayyad al-Ghali, right? The leader of Ansar Din and, well, very well known Machiavellian fixture of Tuareg insurrections in Mali. You know, according to several observers, al-Ghali's embrace of extreme ideology was determined by the fast-moving events that led in January 2012 you know, a prizing that was launched by the MNLA. I mean, Ghali wanted to lead the organization, right? But he was pushed aside. So it's a matter of conjecture whether Ghali's radical trajectory would have been the same if he had been allowed to once again read the revolt against the Malian state. But regardless of what one might think about his 2012 reinvention, as a firebrand radical uh, extremist. You know, the adoption of radical violent extremist posture allowed this guy, Al Ghali, to differentiate himself from the MNLA, while at the same time benefiting from the material support of AQIM. The result is that a few months after the military campaign began in early 2012, Al Ghali emerged as the master of the desert. And some of, of those who joined Lali did not share, I mean, the radical ideology he set for his organization. 
I mean, Rabbas in Tala, I mean, this is the son of the hereditary chief of the Ephugas, who first joined MLA before de defecting to Ansar Din, he acknowledged that his defection to Ansar Din was based on the group's power and better organization. I mean, Rabbas also reportedly mocked the conversion of Al-Ghali into radical Islam. Let's take Muja. Mujahan has, has an even deeper ambivalent relationship to religion, right? Why? Because a non-negligible part of the members of Mujah is constituted of drug traffickers, not known for radical religiosity. So their primary objective is to secure their position in the bitter competition over access to trafficking revenue and control over trafficking routes. And without any particular regard to the harsh religious dogma held by these organizations. So in an environment marked by intense fear, by uncertainty, and by competition among different insurgent factions, the leaders of Mujah understood that the embrace of radical ideology could quickly yield a critical, or at least an early critical advantage, in recruiting the most dedicated fighters that are necessary to build a winning force that can over time entice the support and acquiescence of the majority of the targeted population. So as the case of ISIS in the Middle East shows where we had religious zealots, they intermingled with aggrieved Arab Sunnis, including officers from Saddam Hussein's secular army, Mujah's ranks saw non-ideological wing intermix with a hardcore religious one. And this cohabitation explains why Mujah's application of harsh law was so inconsistent. So in contexts infested with widespread corruption, with state predation, religious values and beliefs, no matter how extreme, they provide a recruiting advantage. Or in the words of one Nigerian political analyst, the call for armed jihad is nothing but a simple, simple cover to play to the crowd. Because what does the crowd want? It wants to liberate itself from suffocating customary norms, from suffocating social hierarchies, and in certain instances from compromised religious authorities and elite that are perceived to be complicit in their plight. So for aggrieved uh, communities, there are situational incentives to join in a winning coalition. As Osama bin Laden once said, when people see a strong horse and a weak horse, I mean, by nature, they will like the strong horse. In this view, it's not the presumed religious radicalism of young men that determines alignment choices. Rather, it's the strategic gains that leaders and the rank and file members aspire to gain that determines what armed groups to join uh, and to support. And this only confirms that violent <coughs> extremist armed groups, they find a niche market today in areas where state institutions, including the religious ones, are perceived as illegitimate. So in this context, viewing Islamic fundamentalism as the main driver of modern insurgencies misdiagnoses the problem. A growing body of research is showing that the endurance and proliferation of these Salafi jihadist groups is not due to increasing levels of religiosity or even to global dynamics. Rather, the most determining factors happen to be local in nature. And first among them are abusive, dysfunctional governments. So, unless African governments acknowledge the conditions that make these violent extremist groups resilient, the challenges to state authority will continue to be characterized and dominated by extremist ideology. Thank you.